Hi, welcome to Live Well with Barry. As you know, it's a program about inspirational people encouraging us to be better people, if that's possible. This week's edition sees the first lady of house. I have to get that title correct. The first lady of house, Kim Mizell. Hello, Hello, Hello Barry. You know I'm very touchy-feely. <laughs> <laughs> and we know lovely that, but we love it. You. It's lovely, lovely to, to be you. here. What a beautiful room. Isn't it fantastic? Fabulous. What Great a beautiful lady. day in London Lovely. Well. I mean, we've got a summer's day here. It's 19 degrees in London. And I left the house in wool. <laughs> well, <laughs> sweating, you know, you never you know? know what it's going to be like. That's you right. have to kind of start off with your layers and then peel them off as the day goes on. Yeah. As we learn from living here. Well, it's lovely to have you. So tell me about you. Where did it start? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Gary, Indiana. Okay, that's um, the same place as the Jackson. The right? home of the Jackson 5, right. yes. I grew up two doors down from the recording studio of the Jackson, so I spent a lot of my early days hearing music, All right. uh, hearing the Jacksons, uh, hearing some of the other groups that came through Stilltown Records from Gladys Knight to the Ripples and the Waves and quite a few other right. groups before... Um, the Jacksons left and went to Detroit. So um, that very early bringing, upbringing music. So you were right in, the in air. it from the beginning. Right in it from the beginning. I, the block that I was on was quite um, notorious for talent. There was a school not far from my house that Denise Williams went to. Right. So that was on the block. And... Um, yeah, Gary is very loaded. I was going to say, Gary seems to be the place that a lot of talent came a from. A lot of talent, a lot of talent. Donald Kenzie and the Kenzie Report came from there. Donald um, right. did the music for Bob Marley and okay. Peter Tosh. He did the uh, Rasta Man Vibrations album for Bob yes, Marley. Yes, that's right. I don't recognize the name. So, yeah, he, was a brilliant, he is a brilliant guitarist. So I grew up around stories of music and... Uh, living it, breathing it, living it, it hearing breathing it. it, hearing it. So it was almost preordained that you were going to go that way. It was one way or the other. I grew up around um, music and uh, civil rights movement. Ah. So I was going to go one way or the other. So let's hear about the civil rights movement. Well, I grew up in the town where the first black mayor of America was voted into office okay. um, in 67, 68, and my dad put him in office. Right. So I grew up around the movement, and Gary, Indiana, was basically 98% um, uh, chocolate city, as they used to call them. <laughs> oh, really? Chocolate city, okay. chocolate and Latino city. Um, it, it was a white city until we got the black mayor, and then they all wanted to move. <laughs> And we as said, bye, <laughs> as they do, you know, but, you know, still, we still kept quite a few of the Caucasians in our city. They didn't all want to move. They didn't, well, all of them couldn't afford to, to because the steel mill was there supporting the jobs and those jobs paid really well. And we had school teachers there. And so it was kind of um, an influx of, of quite a few people. And, and then I was bust like in year uh, grade four fourth grade to the all-white school when I was oh, nine years right. old. So you were right in the heart of that I was right in the heart of, of it. I am a product. Wow. So, yeah, I, yeah, I'm Separate her. Separate schools. Separate schools. For black and white people and being yeah. bused to a white yeah, school. Yeah, and then trying to do the integration. And then and how did that work for you, your personal experience? My personality you, yeah. and personal experience, um... The black school that I went to had a white principal who saw my bubbly personality, and I was quite clever with my work. Um, he, they asked me to the office, and I just walked. I remember walking down the hallway and going there, and a table, something like this, a yeah. boardroom, all these adults, you know, and it was all white uh, teachers at that time, even though it was black and Latin students, sat me down and said, Kim, we want to send you to a new school. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I'm like, I'm eight years old, nine years old, and I'm sitting there, uh-huh. Can you pick 
10 of your friends that are really kind of like you that could go to the new school with you. You're going to go on a bus and blah, blah, blah. You know, and they're telling me to find the other kids to, to go, organize their, to organize their job. It. Yeah, and I'm eight <laughs> years old, but I didn't totally realize I asked my mom and my, you know, my parents weren't really um, objective to it because they knew this, you know, things were moving, we're moving and, and changing. changing. Yeah. And, and I was like the poster girl of mathematics and I was quite clever. So whatever, they just thought, okay. You know, my mom worked full-time, my dad worked full-time uh, for the city. And so I went. And um, unlike Ruby Bridges, I didn't need the National Guards to walk me in. They didn't throw eggs right. at me and so spit in my face. That bad. It wasn't that bad. But when you got in the classrooms, the students were fine. The teachers were not fine. So it was more about the teachers being racist and discriminating the adults you than the children themselves. Than the children themselves. The kids had little issues like... Little things that you knew they'd learn from home. Home weren't from right. That's yeah, it. but if Not you were really learning something about American um, history or something, and being brought up in a black home, I knew black history. So if they tried to teach me something different in the schools, I said, "Well, that's not true. Actually, um, Frederick Douglass is the person who did that." Or you know, you would th Harriet Tubman, and they hadn't had those figures so you went in the with books. Knowledge. I, that yeah. was actually defying what they were telling you. So you were putting your foot down. But so I they didn't know. Like that. They wouldn't like that. Yeah, I didn't know. I just would say that didn't happen like that. Yeah. We learned, you know, yeah. at home and in our books, because we didn't see them when we crossed the railroad tracks the other way. They weren't in the books. And I remember a teacher being very angry with me, taking me to the principal's office, and her nails were quite pointy like mine, and sticking her nails in my arm till they bled. Really? Till my arms bled. She just did not like me that much. I'll never forget that. Too I, bright. That was too, that hate. Yeah. Just knowing, and I think, I think her ignorance played a big part in it too. Yeah. She didn't. She maybe she didn't never heard of Frederick Douglass. Maybe she didn't realize that what she was taught as a white was, person was racist truth, and distort, wrong. Distorted yeah. history. So you get this little eight year old kid. In a school, just going like, no, that's not right. <laughs> no. And that's part of your personality as well. You're going to stand up to it and say, no, you're chatting rubbish. That's not yeah, all. Yeah, I was like, no, that's not it. But I remember her sticking her, her fingernails into my arm and walking me to the principal's office. And, you know, my mom and them coming and them being adults and just saying that Kim doesn't listen. Kim's always questioning the, the, the syllabus. Kim's, all, you know, making me look bad. Yeah. But it was really, it was just race. Yeah. It was really all the, the root of it was race. So you said that it was either the civil rights movement or music. What was the deciding factor? Um, when I got older, I yeah. <laughs> had a bit of colorful language that I had learned. <laughs> and I know that when you got at the podium, like in the 60s, 70s, whatever, your language, you couldn't. <laughs> Use those words. Yeah. So I thought music it is, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, can be free. I can be free with my tongue. Yeah, That's I can right. be free because Millie Jackson, you know, you had those oh, kind wow, of yeah. you had those kind of people Millie who Jackson, were Jackson, oh, yeah, darling, yeah. So you had those kind of people and people, you know, entertainers like Fred Fox and yeah. and uh, Richard Pryor. You know, you you heard these things coming out. From and they were funny. And they in were the funny. In, 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 in the context in which it was funny. Well, in the 70s, the 80s, they would talk about race and politics in a funny way and use the colorful language. And, you know, some of the songs, the records had little, you know, they weren't bad like today. But, you know what I mean? You you had your aunties that come over on the weekend to tell the truth about how they feel. <laughs> they're at home. They're at the barbershop. <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you hear the music. And I was like... It's got to be music. <laughs> I can There's, be free. That can be free. There's no way I'm going to be standing at a podium going, and, you know, the next thing is... <laughs> it just wasn't me. Brilliant. So I love it. It just wasn't going to be me. So what was your first entrance into the music? Um, gosh, that's so long ago. Okay. I guess local talent shows. All oh, right. So you did talent shows. I did a few. Uh -huh. I did a few local talent shows in high school. Um, the high school talent show, um, music in high school, like the choir, um, where you have amazing voices. And and I was kind of, I was kind of looked at as the ugly duckling and the one that would not sing. Really? Yeah, because you had these girls that had church voices. Right. You know, and I didn't have really like church voice, and they were also bullies. 
they were quite bullyish. And, and, and even though I'm like really quite strong and everything now, I had to go through the bullies to build up the strength that, and courage well, yeah, that I've got now. So, yeah. you, know, you know, the playground at school is very tough. It so is. going through school, I, I went through the bullying, I think because I was complexion, we still have colorism, even then, even now, I was not too dark, not too light, long hair, and I was beginning to get boobs. So they don't like you. Right. And I was wanting to sing. So the girls who were whatever bullied me, tried to... Um, Make me not want to sing. You know, you can't sing. I can sing better than you. I don't like and your hair. And that's about You'd, their insecurity, and that's about really, their because they can see you're about to shine. Yeah, they but, can see it in you. Yeah, and you may not see that in yourself. Yeah, you don't see it in yourself, but they see it. Yeah, people see it, and that's their insecurity. You know, break you down, stop you, because I want to get forward. <laughs> you yeah, know, step and on I can you. see if you go, you're gonna get ahead of me. <laughs> you know, it's really cruel. It's a really cruel world. You know, I just kind of, um, I, I don't know. I had it, an insecurity inside of me. Could be uh, people say, oh, that's because you were a Leo, so you had that inner light anyway. Uh, and I, you know, sometimes I would just have to fight against it because after a while. I had to face the bullies and, and, and fight them because they used to chase me home to the front steps and like beat me up in front of the house. Really? Yeah, and my mother one day, I like I used to like to eat food quite a lot. I was a little chubby girl. Okay. <laughs> so, so one day when I came home from school, I don't know, maybe I was about 12 or 13 years old, um, the girl was chasing me. She was thin as a rail. And my mother locked the front door. And wouldn't let me in See, until you know I face. Yeah. You're gonna face have to yeah. face this. Because if bully. you don't, you're gonna have to do this every day. You're gonna have to do this every day, and also I can smell the food cooking. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to go eat my food, so I you know beat what? the girl. I girls. got to beat you. I got to beat you. Because <laughs> so I, I can go get my food, right? Okay. <laughs> oh, <my gosh>. oh, <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, you know, and that gosh, you know, yeah, I had to face it. I had to face it, and that was the way that, you know, back in that time, how we had to do it. I know fast forward, they say you shouldn't fight, you shouldn't, you have to fight. Yeah, sometimes. You may not have to physically fight, but you have to fight in some type of way for your own identity, for your own body consciousness, for your own. Whatever, whatever it is that that you are, if you're a big girl, if you're a thin girl, if you're a dark skin girl, Regard, a light skin girl, whatever, whatever it is, are, you got to stand in your skin. Too much something. You're always for someone too much somewhere. for somebody. Yes, yeah, like, yeah. you just too much. I was like, yeah. well, I'm gonna be too much because I'm entertaining myself. Yeah. Thank you very yeah, yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the first lady of house. The first lady of house music. Yeah. How was that? How did that start? What was the first single? Um, what started that process? Well, you know, fast forward, I graduated, went to university. What did um, you study? I studied arts and entertainment, media okay. management, entertainment Perfect. law. Perfect. Yeah, I yeah, I was listening to my mother, and you know, lots of musicians had they didn't understand how to read the contracts and I came along where you how know useful is I that? used to watch everything growing up. I used to watch the heartaches of like Billy Holidays who had signed things and different people because you trust people. You don't know yeah. how cutthroat this industry is that people are taking your talent and raising their kids and building houses um, yeah. off of your stuff because you signed something In that ignorance. they ignorance. And and it's In not even ignorant they've made a law also, that makes that signature binding to them thiefing you. Yeah. yeah. That's dark. So I went to university to, like, kind of learn that, um, the industry and those kind of things. So you were things. really set in your path to go into music properly. I was from, from yeah, yeah, from... To set it in properly. Yeah, from that. And I had a daughter, so okay. my daughter came along uh, to school with me. I was a single mom, yes, a teenage single mom, and made it through, took her to university with me. Um, on campus, we stayed together. And while I was studying at an all women's Catholic college, <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? All women's Catholic With college, that tongue? living <laughs> on the dorm. Well, I can't call me that. <laughs> Trust me, they got tongues themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Not the nuns, but the other students, the other right, girls. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. child. So, but they let me come in because I had a daughter and they had a, because it was all women and all girls. It was fine for me to live on campus with my daughter. The other girls would babysit when I went to class. Perfect. And it really, really worked out. It was in Chicago, and it was during the time when they had the um, 
when you could do an interchanging program with another school. So I found out about Columbia College in Chicago, and they did all these mu music classes, uh, entertainment management, entertainment law, uh, marketing, uh, copyrights, um, all kind of things. I was like, that's where I need to be. Yeah. So I did an internship program um, there, and from there I started hearing about um, these clubs, these underground clubs that was going on. And I'd go, and I'd listen to this music that wasn't form. It was just... Free. It was free. Organic. It was, it was organic. It was sampling of things as well. Yeah. And um, they had, I guess, new DJs coming, and, and I met Marshall Jefferson there and Frankie Knuckles. Well, now there, the And that's names. where it started. Yeah. And um, one place that I did an internship uh, at DJ International Records um, sent me once on, on the road as... I guess a, a tour person to help two of their three of their artists. One was Lolita Holloway. Ooh, you had school. I had school, school in my mouth. You had uh, one was Lolita Holloway. One was Sean Christopher, and one was Daryl Pandy, who made okay. Love Can't Turn Around. Yeah. So I was thrust into it into the club world in New York, and I had to make sure that they got their whatever they wanted, teas, coffees, alcohol, right. uh, private just dressing room, uh, their money in cash. I had to do all that and didn't know what, what, what I was doing. is my girl, man. Lolita, so, baby. Yeah. This woman, this woman taught me so much. Yeah, just yeah, watching true. her. Um, she, she used to do a lot of her songs. She'd mime them. Right. And she had it to a T. Um, Everything, the expression, because she might have a sore throat that night, or she may do be doing three shows. Yeah, it she was at the sing full voice yeah. in all of them. So. so you do one where you sing, you know, you save that for the last one or the middle one, and the other two you'd have to mime and insert live because and it's your tune and it's your so tune. You, so you so know you did it, sing it, and, out, so. and the crowd loved her. They just want her to be there. It it was really really amazing to watch and. Um, yeah, and the cussing that was going on. <laughs> Child, Lord, I'm missing. Ah, I learned how to cuss. <laughs> Some more. <laughs> Some I knew more. I learned how to get that money too. Yeah. So, so that was like the beginning of it, and I ended up one day uh, at my came to be my business partner and lawyer, Dwayne Powell's office. And Marshall was doing a, a session, and they wanted me to come down and do some BVs. So I went down to do the BVs uh, on this record called Taste My Love. And the lead singer couldn't sing. And I had laid down all the backing vocals. And I saw them through the glass while I was back there on the mic. I saw them through the glass speaking to her. And I saw her being very, very, very upset leaving and slamming the door and I thought I know they want me to sing that this song. That was my chance. I said that I know they want me to sing this song. <laughs> so I sang that song, uh, Taste My Love. That was 1987. Put it out on my label, my label with my um, two business partners because I created my own label. With all the, from watching. the legal knowledge that you had yes. and everything you could yes. create that yourself. And I had two partners and we knew what a press record so um, we ended up doing that. That was 30 years ago. Wow. Yeah, 1987. Taste My Love was the first Taste single. Yeah, and then it just first went Lady up, of House. up from there. That record came to UK. Uh -huh. The British DJs or whatever was about, I think it was a dead zone happening. Um, disco had stopped because um, they started blowing up the disco records. Remember when they did Disco Sucks? They did a Disco Sucks movement yeah, yeah. in America. They took all of the records into Kaminsky Park in Chicago, baseball field, and uh, I can't remember the DJ because I worked for him too as an um, as, uh, um, intern, but they blew up all the records. So there was a gap and there was just rock. So Hops came in that inadvertent in that part, gap, in that yeah. interim, in that gap, and the DJs from, or whoever they were, from London would come to New York and Chicago and pick yeah, up these this, music. this mm -hmm. broken, not yet developed records and take them back to the UK. And you guys were building like a rave culture, which we didn't know about, yeah. and playing these records on radio, which we didn't know was pirate, something called pirate radio, oh, yeah. which we found out when we came here, yeah. Kiss and Choice. Yeah. And my record, Taste My Love, was like one of the main records. I called somebody over here. I got their number from one of the uh, house artists that was coming to work. I called him. I said, hi, I'm Kim Mazzell. Um, I want to come to London. He said, are you Kim Mazzell that made Taste My Love? I said, yes. He said, 
you have a hit record over here on the radio. Um, who's your representative? You don't can, even we know about you? It. can we book you? I was like, I'm my representative. <laughs> <laughs> we go direct. <laughs> we go direct. So um, we set it up. David Levy um, brought me over here. Um, the money was terrible. It was nothing like um, what you got in Chicago. But I knew it was an opportunity to show, showcase. And when I came here, opened my eyes because I found out that this record of mine was being played on these stations like every second. Yeah. But I still didn't know it was a pirate station. And I didn't. we didn't know what pirates were. Yeah. We just know we were on radio in England. Yeah. And people weren't playing us on the radio in America. And that's the thing. The mainstream, those pirate radio stations, and there was a whole movement, as you say, they broke a lot of records, a lot of artists yes. in England. Yes. That mainstream radio simply weren't playing. Yes. You know? Yes. And when it, when it just broke me, I guess... A and R people. Then we had A and R people. I don't think we have them that much now. They just started going. Who's this Kim Mazel? Who's this Kim Mazel? I did a showcase and started a bidding war with all the labels, and I ended up signing um, the first uh, major label deal for house music artists to EMI worldwide for five albums for five hundred thousand pounds, which U.S. was a million dollars. Right. For five albums, that's the first days, deal. Yeah. That was it was two to one then. Yeah, the it was. So it was one you of those. Did it at the right time. <laughs> did it at the right time. Yeah, but I didn't end up doing all the albums, oh, so I didn't right. get the full thing. I didn't get all. They gave you like a hundred grand each album you did, plus all the expenses for your PR, your press. Um, some things were um, recoupable, but because I knew the law, I knew them terms. I was like, this is non-recoupable. This is, not, you know, I just went. right. You see, that's the advantage you have because a lot of artists they go in and they get their advance and they're like, yeah. Yeah, got my advance, but they're taking all the expenses out of that. Yeah, and they, you know, so yeah. you're actually paying for it, not the record company. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you know, I just kind of, um, yeah. So that's how I became the first lady of house. It's really historical that it happened that I got signed. So um, have you been doing stuff all along? Because it seemed like Kim Mazel had gone quiet for a while. Um, I did go quiet for a while. Okay. Um, that's where my faith came in. I, I got the call from the Lord. Okay. Jesus on the main line. Tell okay. him what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> and he's still delivering. And he's still delivering, baby. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, I got this call in, in my spirit, and, and I didn't know what it was, so... I said, let me go check this out because I, I didn't come over here as um, a Christian or whatever, a church person. I didn't know anything about that. I just knew music. I was educated. I had morals and uh, stuff like that. But, you know, I didn't know about God and yeah. God things. So you didn't come up in the church at home? No, I didn't. All oh, right. I wasn't brought up in the church. Because a lot of the voices from the States, you know, come from the church originally. Yeah. So. But right. I, I was I, I lived near a church. <laughs> <laughs> My mother went to church every Sunday, and I was like, "See, Mom." I mean, I went to Sunday school probably when I was little, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and all of that. But, but a lot of artists, you know, they've honed their voice yeah. in the church. Yeah. So you're not one of those. I didn't have that. Yeah. No, I didn't. I I listened to records. I'd listen to uh, Gladys Knight and you know Aretha Franklin and sing along with the record with the uh, towel on my head as yeah. my hair. That's and the hairbrush. Yeah. <laughs> So I was doing that. And I think we've all done that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was the hair, and the hairbrush was the mic, and and that was kind of, you know, the way yeah. I came up. I, I, I was always I interested in the more sassy singers, I guess. Right. Because, you know, I... I, I You're sassy. Yeah, I didn't you know I was sassy. sassy, but I did like, um, you know, Tina Turner and the review, the I catch, because they had, you know, that energy. And, and yeah, I did like Millie Jackson. I loved also... Gladys Knight, um, but I like Chaka Khan, child. Yeah. When she came out with them feathers and all yeah. her hair, <laughs> tell me something good. Yeah. Um, you knew what she was talking about, <laughs> and I was like, I don't, I want to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think she go to church. <laughs> Sorry, that I just, you know, I love not it. then. We're going back to the seventies, eighties, yeah. you know. Uh, so, yeah, so... So you did go quiet for a period. I but, did. But before that, tell me about your Soul to Soul section now. Oh, uh, Soul to Soul. Yeah. Happy face, a thumb and bass uh -huh. for a loving race. That's right. <laughs> That's B all the way through. Um, 
Soul to Soul. Soul to Soul. How did I see you, was it? Yeah, yeah, but I'm trying, mm-hmm. to, trying to remember the... the um, ah, I was in Camden singing uh, my album that I had signed to EMI at Dingwalls. Oh, right, yeah. on his doorstep. <laughs> I was at Dingwalls. He was in the back, him and Nellie Hooper, watching my set. Okay. When I finished the set, he came up to the side and said, Kim is old, I'm Jesse B, whatever, whatever. I was like, yeah. He said, well, why don't you come blow a tune? I was like, okay. It was like 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. And we went back to the studio. It was in Primrose Hill somewhere. Okay. I remember. And they played that beat for me. And they kept playing it. And I sat down. And it came out just like this. Missing you. You're the sweetest. I, never, I got behind the microphone. Start singing it. And we recorded it live that night, and that was it. Really? That was it. It was done just like, it was so much energy though going on in London. London was buzzing. You had like the loft going on with yeah. Paul Trouble Anderson Correct. and all those people. You had like, um, it was all, you had the, the uh, Shoon, the Happy Happy Shoon, Shoon was yes. underground Absolutely. party with uh, oh, yeah. Danny Rampling. You had um, Legends with uh, Neville, Spike and Neville that were doing that party. You had Wag. You had, Wag. All, you had so uh, who else was just coming out? Uh, Sade was yeah. just coming out. Um, you had uh, uh, Wham uh, had just finished and George Michael was doing the double bass thing. Yeah. Was in, it was just all this, all these clubs, heaven, uh, you know, yeah. all of this That's energy, right. 24-7. Yeah. And these pirate stations in Brixton and then uh, Camden and then like Choice of Femme, I think might have been in Brixton as well. Mm. <clears throat> and it was just all this energy. So when I got, when Jazzy came and got me that night from the WAG, the studio was full. Full of funky dreads, full of funky red ginger. Uh, he was doing some music. Simon. Simon. Simon Law. Simon Law. Who we've had on the show before. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I, I wrote Mr. You with Simon Law and Jazzy. Yeah. In one room on this night, they were remixing Ghetto Heaven by Family Stance. Yeah. In the other room, they were remixing Nothing Compares to You by Sinead O'Connor. And I was writing Missing You in the other room. That's the energy, energy that, that was, was going, going on in yeah. that in that night, in that morning. So everything had to. It was telepathy. Yeah. It, it just came out. It was coming to you. It was. It was, it was like, you, I was yeah. like the vibes. The and energy, there it was. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So and then I did the world tour. Right. I did the world tour, which was good. And in hindsight, I could have. Because I had my album out. I left my album project to go on. To go to <laughs> <laughs> And, you know. Didn't use your business at then, I did. Yeah. Well, you, you, you don't have time. When, once, yeah. Once when the world will come. In it. Yeah. You're caught up in it. You ain't going to step back. And, I wasn't schizophrenic like that. <laughs> <laughs> you saved that for later. The record. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but the record company could have, like, said. We did some things where in the towns that I was in. Um, promoting Soul to Soul, I promote my album. Yeah, EMI would yeah. come out and we promote it, but but it wasn't like every place. And thinking back, thinking I don't know if I had the energy mm, to if, do if, both, if, if to probably. travel, yeah. uh, do both, do three shows because I don't I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a lot. I, I, it, it, yeah, it, it was a lot because we were everywhere, Japan. Um, Every country, you, did I go to Africa with them? No, I went to Africa on my own. Okay. Um, but we were everywhere. We went all across America. It was just really a lot of energy, a great time for music. And b- again, being a pioneer at the beginning of another um, sound, Movement, yeah, uh, sound, which was Soul to Soul. It's such a distinctive sound. That it's soul such a distinctive sound. sound yeah, so. I remember when Keep On Moving dropped, and that was their first big thing. Well, I think... Um, Rose Windross did the one before that. Yeah, but wouldn't it be that, fair? Fair play. Yeah, yeah, fair play. But when that Soul to Soul tune dropped in that party, I remember it. White label, everyone just went through the scene. Wow. Ceiling. I mean, keep on moving. And yeah. still today, it yeah. gives you that feeling when you play. You yes, know, it does. It really, really does. So I'm really, really uh, grateful and happy to have been part of that project. And, you know, knowing the people. I think also because I had a, a lot of people don't know this. I used to be in a, quite a lot of reggae bands to okay. put myself through school when I was in university. All right. Oh, yeah, I was an I-plet. Not an I-tall, but an I-plet. So I used to do, like, a lot you of... You learned something new yeah, about yeah, the I was, lady. I was a dreadlock right? okay. child. Yeah, so, so it was easy for me to understand 
um, jazzy and a lot of the yeah, West Indian right. culture and a lot of the songs I already knew from Donald Kinsey who had been my neighbor who had worked with Peter Tosh and, and Bob Marley and Don Taylor who was our manager then rest in peace Don had been the manager of Bob Marley and all of them so right. when I said to him do you know Donald Kinsey? He just grabbed me and hugged me. He said, "Oh, your family, <laughs> your just, family." That's just, right. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was a great time. Yeah, it, it was, was a, a really great, great, great time. time, and so many things just merged together. So yeah. now I'm seeing you all over the place. Master Chef, you've done, yeah, and there's this reemergence of Kim Mizell, yeah, again on on mainstream TV, which yeah. is great. Yeah, it's great. It's a great thing. Um, I think. Um, when you don't burn bridges and you're good people, that's right. You yeah. know, never burn bridges. You know, good people, good people. You're reliable. Yeah. You know, um, someone said to me when I did this show at the Hideaway for my thirtieth, um, one of the guys was saying, "You've been in the industry thirty years and not one scandal," and I never thought about that. Yeah. I was like, wow, I can be scandalous. <laughs> 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 but I thought, you know what? Oh, that's really good, you know. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's that's commendable. I would, you know, when you grow up in a black family, West Indian family, you go somewhere. They say, don't put your family name to shame. Angel, that's right. You're representing us when You're you go out there. Yes. Yeah? So watch what you do. Watch what you do. So I think that always stayed in me. Yeah. You know. That's so true. There you go. So what's your last project now? What are you doing now? Because um, I see there's something on Channel 5, is it? Oh, yeah. Well, I've been working with Channel 5 recently on... Uh, they have a franchise called When Goes Horribly Wrong. Okay. When talk shows go horribly wrong, when celebrities go horribly wrong. And I've been sitting as a panelist with quite a few other celebrities on that show. We've done one when Mariah Carey had the debacle on New Year's Eve and her mic didn't work. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. you know, quite a lot of things. You just talk about how they went wrong and what could have happened um, better. Um, I've done a few documentaries as well for um, Channel 5. I did The Man in the Mirror which is the documentary on Michael Jackson's All right, life. because you both come from the same Gary, Indiana. Because we come from the same Gary, Indiana, and the okay. kind of same area. So I've done quite a few things for television, along with Celebrity MasterChef, <coughs> excuse me, where I came in as a semifinalist, and I've done quite a few uh, things. I did the Celebrity Pointless right. um, show recently with um, one of the Osmond brothers, because we were representing America. They sort of did the nations, and they had, like, we represented America. Okay. They had Ireland, they had Australia, Spain, a couple other countries. We didn't do too bad. That show kind of manipulates your mind. You have to think of the least popular that's right thing, not the um, most not the most popular because yeah. you automatically go to think yeah because usually yeah. that's the most numbers but yeah and and it, it just does your brain because you're trying to switch it and you can't switch it quick enough because i'll come up with things after you know the time is over <laughs> yeah. for you to answer i'm going like oh, oh i know yeah and, but it's always too late now i just go like oh well i hope i, <laughs> I hope i don't look too bad on television <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, doing some of the television things, still, you know, touring and um, doing the um, shows and because DJing and all those big festivals now are really big. Um, house is a resurgence. Yeah. And, and, you know, young people are becoming aware of house music. So I've been doing quite a lot of festivals over the last couple of years and things like that. So, yeah, just keeping busy. We are a busy, busy Touring girl. America, England. Spain, yeah, you're living, girl. teaching young people, right. you know, to be respectful to adults and to themselves, yeah. just trying to help, and especially things like bullying. I've been working with like young kids because I, I, you know, so obviously like I went through that mentoring uh, programs. Uh, I'm uh, also on the board as a patron for Sickle Cell Society, right. which is one of the things I'm, I hold dear to my heart because uh, a lot of people are not aware about. Um, that uh, very debilitating disease sickle yeah. cell, and that it crosses the board of people. It's not just black people that get it. It's lots of different which races. Which is what is the general assumption. Which is the general assumption. So we don't really get the funding, yeah. enough of the funding for that. You may get, like, Macmillan or get funding, or these other people get funding, but uh, sickle cell society may not get it. And I think the, it's an awareness yeah. issue that, People need to really kind of wake up because of so much interracial Mixing, business yeah, yeah, that right. you could be walking around with it, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't you just love this girl? <laughs> you love this girl? So tell me, you're so, so busy. 
What does Kim Mizell do to look after Kim and keep her balance and equilibrium? Because with all these things that you're doing, you're traveling, you're up and down, yeah. you've got to change your, your different caps for each, <laughs> yeah. for each yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How, what do you do to look after yourself? I rest. Right. I drink quite a lot of water. I like swimming. Okay. Swimming's good for me and sailing. I love sailing. water. Yeah. Right. Sailing is it's the best one. Do you get to do that often? Yeah. Nice. I do. That's lovely. Yeah, I do. So, um, yeah. Well, this show is all about inspirational people, and that's why we had to have you as a guest. Fabulous. Because, Thank you. Because, you know, it's great to see that you were doing 30 years ago, and you're still here doing as much now as you were then, probably more. Oh, gosh. Oh. So, you know, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Barry. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It. I appreciate you Lovely and your audience you. and all of you out there. Thank you so much. Look after yourselves. Indeed. Thank you very much for joining us yet again and look forward to next episode. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you.